Listen, you can cry and manipulate and try to do everything you can about national revival, but it's not going to happen until God moves first in an individual's life. This is the law of God. God strikes the spiritual match with one individual, and if God is allowed to be let loose among his people, it will spread from church to church until a nation is affected. Welcome to Real Life, and today we're going to be talking about something that um, I believe, I think you'll believe as well, is very, very important, and I hope it's extremely practical. And it's this, when we have been, and, and many times in our get-togethers, we've talked about prophetic-type doctrines of the Bible, and uh, about Christ's return for the church, and all these things, and listen, a very good thing to keep in mind, and, and, and I hope this is something that you can use forever. Rather than get bogged down in the debates with people about, well, I don't believe he's coming back, or I don't know when, and you can't know this, and the other thing and that, whatever, let that stuff dissipate and dial down and focus, believer, on this, revival. I'm talking to the Christian today. Listen, revival. When we talk about revival, and there's a lot of people talking about it, there are conferences on revival, there are so many books on revival. What are we talking about when we mention the word revival? Well, number one, we have to understand that it's in the, it's in the atmosphere of, of the Christian community. Now, that's not to say, listen, it's not to say that Islam uh, is going through a sense of revival. Uh, a lot of people around the world think that uh, it's cool to be a Muslim and, and Islam's seeing their ranks grow. What is that? Islam's experiencing a revival. Those that are in Shintoism, believe it or not, Shintoism is seeing a, a, a growth. What are they experiencing? Revival. Revival is not limited to just the, the Christian conversation. It means to be revived. It means to bring more life, uh, an awakening. And so economies can experience a revival. And here's the thing, vive. The word vive comes from vitality or life, to be living. To revive is to bring new life, fresh life. So when we talk about the context of Christianity, we're talking about the church being revived. Now the church needs a revival. Again, everybody's singing about it and everybody's talking about it. But we're really not seeing, in my opinion, we are really not seeing a true biblical revival. Why? Number one, a true biblical revival always begins with the individual first, the person, you, me. The revival in the believer's life starts with us personally. How does that happen? God the Holy Spirit begins to stir up the believer to see their great, great need of getting back to key elements, I should say the elements of Christianity. Get back to the Bible. Get back to prayer. Listen, get back to study. Get back to worship. What are we talking about? We're talking about the believer being revived in the essentials of what it means to be a Christian. There's not going to be a national revival until there's a personal revival. Your church cannot be revived. Your community cannot be revived until you are revived. So we always begin, first of all, with you and I. Every revival in the Bible, every revival in history always begins with a person. God will bring two, three, four, ten people who are experiencing personal revival together. It often manifests itself in Bible reading, simple, simply reading, reading the scriptures in a small group, praying, conviction falls upon that heart, repentance begins to break out at that table with one person at a time, and what happens when there's a spark, just like a match, when, when, a, when a spark happens, when the striking of a match takes place, it starts out ever so small and it begins to spark. There's a little bit of a nova or a supernova and then it begins to kindle and then it begins to glow and then it begins to burn. How does that happen? Revival must always begin with the individual first. 
So when you and I read about revival as believers, and we want to see revival, we can't post on the building, revival here tomorrow night. Doesn't work. Doesn't work that way. Starts privately, starts personally, and it looks like this. Wow, God, I have strayed from you. I need to draw closer to you. Lord, I ask you to convict of my sins. Show me where I, I've erred. God begins to show you the error of your ways. You begin to repent of them. God, I'm sorry for this. God, I'm sorry for that. Lord, revive my spirit. Cause your Holy Spirit to take over my life. And may I think Bible. May I speak Bible. May I walk in a continuance of your awareness in my life. God, do that to me. And that tends, though I don't want to stress emotionalism by no means, but that tends to breed within us a very loving response where we begin to actually experience God. And I want to underline experience God. It could be in silent meditation. It could be in, in great weeping before God. It could be standing with your hands raised. It could be on your face before him. But the point is, it's personal. And that's how revival begins. It must first begin in America and in the world personally. You can't buy it. You can't rent a hall and say it's going to happen next Sunday night. And you can't advertise for it. It happens when you and I decide to seek the Lord in all sincerity, to pursue Him, to go after Him. That's where revival begins. It begins with you and I. Welcome to Real Life Radio with Jack Hibbs. God's Word never will return void. God's Word is spirit, it's power, and it has its effect. So I want to encourage you to grab your Bibles, open them up, and get ready to learn from God's Word. God did not give us Bible prophecy to scare us, but to prepare us. But I think you're going to get a lot out of it, and one of the great reasons You are the light of the world, Jesus said. You are the salt of the earth. How does that happen? By the power of the Holy Spirit. You're going to get excited about what Jesus Christ wants to do in and through you. Well, listen, we just heard about a revival that must begin with you and I first, personally, privately. But the next thing is this, when the revival of God comes upon us as a person, you and I, as an individual, the very next thing that's affected, listen carefully, is family. Those that we come in contact with on a regular basis. This is one of the greatest witnesses of all that when a personal revival takes place, no matter what has gone on in the past, Christian, in your life, no matter what's happened up until yesterday, when God began to get a hold of you and I, the next area of revival will naturally take place in the family. You've read in the book of Acts where a man accepts the Lord and the Bible tells us that he went home and he told his family and he and his whole family got saved. That's revival. That's how God moves. This man was touched. He went home and his family saw the difference in his life and they were experiencing life with him. Now that context is mainly evangelistic, but the same spiritual law is true today family. Revival will then take place within the family. Others will see, be influenced, and what happens? God gets a hold of an individual in the family. Revival begins to take place, and that Christian home that has been maybe somewhat lackadaisical or maybe somewhat off course, somewhat uh, complacent about walking with Jesus, that family gets fired up. They are re- Vived, and there's an infusion. And what happens is that family becomes a nucleus. This is very key for where we're going to go and the two closing arguments about what is revival. The second being family. When God begins to move in a family uh, in the sense of revival, uh, there's almost nothing that cannot be achieved for the glory of God. That family could be living in the most godless city in the world. That family could be living on the most godless street 
in the world. And what happens is that family begins to be affected by God's work and revival. And mom and dad, the marriage is recouped. The marriage is revived. The relationship between dad and son or dad and daughter is renewed. Mom with son, mom with daughter. There's a renewal. Brothers and sisters, there's a renewal. People see it. And there's an effect, and it changes you in all the ways that you and I function. This is God honoring his own creation, and that is the family. The family unit is where the Christian experience is, no doubt, the, the most difficult place to really live out our Christianity because of the familiarity of one another. It's where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. It's tough going in the family. But when the Lord is allowed to be in control of the family, and that begins with one person, then a revival takes place within that home. And this is very exciting because for you and I, we can, number one, feel a little bit defeated. Oh my goodness, my family, boy, whew, you know. And why is that? Because we all know so much about one another in the family uh, experience, but that's where great grace comes in. <laughs> Thank God, right? God begins to move. The Holy Spirit begins to soothe over hurts and pains. He begins to tell us, listen, that is gone. This is a new creation. And can I say, Christian family, he can say to you and I today, this is a new recreation within your home. God is saying to you in your home, I started with one of you. It's spreading to two and three and four of you. I've got a plan. I'm doing something. I'm reviving your family. And I'm going to use you guys as a witness. All of a sudden, you actually have a 24-7 God-honoring church inside your house. It's not the church on Sunday. It's the church every day in your house. And this is what's God's work in your life as a revival within the home. Starts with one person spreads to another, begins to affect the entire family. And what happens is you've got a godly home that is exalting Jesus Christ and walking in the grace of God. Hallelujah, right? Because none of us are perfect and we won't be perfect. But when there's a revival happening in people's hearts, there's a whole lot of grace that is extended and it's a wonderful way to live. Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and all of these other things will be added to you. The third thing, listen, is so often misunderstood. And the third thing regarding revival is the church. See, people think that the revival is going to happen in the church. That's where it's going to start. And that's the wrong way to view it. The church, we drive by or we think, you know what? I'm going to go uh, to church and I'm going to see what I'm going to feel there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check out what I experience. How does it make me feel? Uh, what's the vibe? And uh, what's in it for me? And so I'm going to go to church. I need to add something to my life. And so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to church. And it's all wrong. You're not to go to church for that stuff. I know people do that. Here's the deal. The church, number one, no one wants to go to a dead church. It's a waste. Have you been to a dead church? You can't wait to leave. You can't wait to get out of there. It's painful. A dead church needs to be revived. Can it be revived? That church has to make that decision. You say the church, like, what do you mean? Like the building? Of course not. It starts, remember, with one person, then a family. And when God is moving, that affects the church. Watch this. A church that is going through revival is simply... A gathering of people who individually have decided to seek the Lord. They congregate together and the fire begins to spread. Remember, it starts with one person in the family. Then it spreads to the family and a godly family will spread to a church. When that happens, the church is being revived. The church being revived. It's not an institution that has to be revived. It's not an address that has to be revived. It's not a building that has to be revived. It is God's Holy Spirit being free to work in the lives of individuals that happen to be under the same roof or at the same gathering, wherever that might be, and he begins to move. So listen, friends, technically, revival can 
break open in a parking lot. It can break open on a street corner. It can break open anywhere God's people are gathered together and they determine we are going to seek God. We're going to get back to the word. We're going to get back to prayer. We're going to get back to worship. We are going to get back to obedience to him. We're going to follow him. And when that happens, listen, what's, this is so awesome. And listen, I hope this encourages some of you who may be somewhere in the world. You could be in Africa under a tree thinking, oh gosh, we'll never get to have revival because we don't have four walls and a roof. God doesn't need four walls and a roof. Those could be hindrances. If two or more are gathered together to seek him, expect revival. And that church begins to affect the world around it. The church that you want to go to is a church that is experiencing revival. It's not going to be perfect. It's going to have all kinds of flaws because God uses flawed creatures like us, okay? But the Holy Spirit is free to move. He's free to work. He's free to touch his people to use them. And when revival is taking place, you'll see a rise in spiritual gifts being sought after and used. You will see the church no matter what it achieves, humble, seeking God. You'll see a church that's praying. You'll see a very high view of the word of God in that church. And you'll see a church that is walking, I would like to put it this way, in the awe of God. What does that mean? The awe, in the fear of the Lord. I mean, it's a great church to attend. You're having a tremendous time. God's moving. And look, honestly, you are feeling better about it because you sense the movement of God. And that's a great thing. You're not focused on the feeling, but we're not stoics. We have feelings, but we are focused on what God is doing. Everybody who cares about God wants to be involved in a work that God is doing the work. And that excites you. So the truth is, if you are experiencing a revival in your church, just know that it's not paid advertisement. It's not some sort of feature that has been put forth or a banner that says revival here Sunday morning. No, if you're experiencing revival in your church, it's because that church has sought the word of God and the spirit of God. It means that families first have been affected by the power of God's word and God's spirit. That means that an individual has been touched by God and that the Spirit of God is moving. So there's a progression. One, then to a family, then to a church, irregardless of that church's size. And God's Holy Spirit will move. And the next step that God takes with a people is most exciting. And when that happens, then there's no telling what can take place in the entire world. Since 1973, the United States has killed over 70 million viable children in the womb. Now, more kids have died in the womb since 1973 than all those who died in the Vietnam War. Think of that. The best argument that the pro-abortionist has is, I believe in the woman's right to her own body. So do I. I believe in a person's choice. So do I. Socialism has never worked. It's never worked anywhere. Europe is reeling from failed socialism. The Soviet Union imploded. China is growing right now. Get this, China is only growing because in the last 25 years, China has embraced capitalism. The truth of the matter is no one, hello, listen, no one has ever worked for a poor man. Transgenderism, what are we talking about? We're actually talking more about a psychological issue rather than a scientific issue. We're actually talking about a cultural, listen, I don't mean to hurt anybody's feelings. We're talking about a social aberration, racism, racism. Aren't you kind of tired of hearing about it? I'm tired of hearing about it. Everything's about racism, everything, everything. I don't think so. I think there's a certain people group that have access to a, a microphone, and I'm not talking about a people group that is of any color. I think it's being really put together by people of all kinds of colors that have an agenda to push, so they make everything a race issue. Listen, this is what the Bible says about racism, that God hates it. Racism is a sin. 
And so the final aspect of revival, what happens when it happens with one individual? My dear friend, if you just look at church history, you'll see where countries like Scotland or England or Wales or the United States in the colonial period of the United States, one person in these settings sought God, experienced God, they were revived and they began to proclaim. Families changed, churches were aflame with the truth of God and it began to spread from church to church. What happened? The nation has changed. National revival. You say, yeah, yeah, right, right on, Pastor. The Bible says, if my people who are called by my name, you know, repent, cry out, call to me, I'm going to heal their land. National revival. Let's do it. Listen, you can cry and manipulate and try to do everything you can about national revival, but it's not going to happen until God moves first in an individual's life, then a family, then a church. And what happens is the church leads the way nationally to revival. You see the pocket of believers in the days of Israel. How did the nation revive? God poured out his Holy Spirit upon people. Some of them, one priest or one king was touched by God. And the, the sweeping power of that affected the entire nation. That's the key. How will England be revived? What about Wales or Scotland today? What about the United States of America? What about Mexico? What about the nation you might be in? Can it actually seek God? Well, it all depends if there's one individual to stand in the gap and be revived by the power of God. One person. This is the law of God. God strikes the spiritual match with one individual. And if God is allowed to be let loose among his people. It will spread from church to church until a nation is affected. And I'm wondering right now, for those of us who live in the United States, it seems like there are so few churches teaching the Bible. Hey, maybe there are so few of churches teaching the Bible. But what if those churches that are teaching the Bible, seeking the Holy Spirit, and are operating themselves in the awe of God, seeing God move and seeing God work as their greatest desire, what if? What if a handful of those churches in the United States of America, God uses to strike a match to the nation, where the nation is once again, maybe perhaps one final time in these last days, where America could experience revival? Imagine for a moment, what will it look like? I think we can guess. It's going to look like holiness. It's going to look like the word of God being exalted. It's going to look like, listen, righteousness. So what does that mean? Well, I can tell you this. It's not going to look like more awesome songs. We love awesome songs, but it's not going to look like that. It's not going to look like big, big churches, mega churches. It's not going to look like that. It's not going to look like the government saying, we love Christians. It's not going to look like that. When God revives he does it nationally just like he did it personally with you, with me. Conviction of sin, we repent of our sins, we turn to him, and the Holy Spirit pours out the righteousness of Christ in us. We begin to do the right thing. You know, listen, in American history, that's what made America so epic in the world around us. It wasn't our economy. It was the fact that America did the right thing. And the nations of the world recognized that. Why? America was under the effect of a revival. That can happen again, but it's going to start with you and I doing the right thing. The Holy Spirit's going to move in us doing righteousness. He doesn't care how high we jump when we get excited in church. He doesn't care how cool the song is. He doesn't care about lights or the smoke or fog in a service. He cares about us being righteous vessels, yielded to him to do, Lord, whatever you want to do. Here I am, send me. And with that proclamation of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 6 in the book of Isaiah, he experienced a personal revival, and it led to the changing of a nation. That's what America needs. That's what your nation needs, is for one person to seek God with all their heart, and it will spread through your life until, by God's grace, a nation is forced to look at righteousness. 
revival. May God bring revival to the United States, for that matter, to the world of believers all around this globe. One final time, I pray before Christ returns, one more shining of the light that the world might see. God bless you. We'll see you back next time right here on Real Life. If you'd like to know more, you can go to reallifewithjackhibbs.org or you could visit us on YouTube at Real Life Jack Hibbs YouTube channel and click and subscribe there. God bless you. We'll see you once again. Welcome to Real Life Radio with Jack Hibbs. God's Word never will return void. God's Word is spirit, it's power, and it has its effect. So I want to encourage you to grab your Bibles, open them up, and get ready to learn from God's Word. God did not give us Bible prophecy to scare us, but to prepare us. But I think you're going to get a lot out of it in one of the great reasons. You are the light of the world, Jesus said. You are the salt of the earth. How does that happen? By the power of the Holy Spirit. You're going to get excited about what Jesus Christ wants to do in and through you. Since 1973, the United States has killed over 70 million viable children in the womb. Now, more kids have died in the womb since 1973 than all those who died in the Vietnam War. Think of that. The best argument that the pro-abortionist has is, I believe in the woman's right to her own body. So do I. I believe in a person's choice. So do I. Socialism has never worked. It's never worked anywhere. Europe is reeling from failed socialism. The Soviet Union imploded. China is growing right now. Get this. China is only growing because in the last 25 years, China has embraced capitalism. The truth of the matter is no one, hello, listen, no one has ever worked for a poor man. Transgenderism, what are we talking about? We're actually talking more about a psychological issue rather than a scientific issue. We're actually talking about a cultural, listen, I don't mean to hurt anybody's feelings. We're talking about a social aberration, racism, racism. Aren't you kind of tired of hearing about it? I'm tired of hearing about it. Everything's about racism, everything, everything. I don't think so. I think there's a certain people group that have access to a, a microphone, and I'm not talking about a people group that is of any color. I think it's being really put together by people of all kinds of colors that have an agenda to push, so they make everything a race issue. Listen, this is what the Bible says about racism, that God hates it. Racism is a sin.